La, 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 Nina. Climate Prediction Center, February 8th, ENSO alert system status. We are still in an El Nino advisory. However, we have now added a La Nina watch. we got both of them going on at the same time here, and I'll show you what I mean. Collectively, the coupled ocean atmosphere system reflected a weakening El Nino. However, that does not mean it's a dead El Nino. But changes are afoot underneath the ocean surface. As you can see on the diagram, that cooler water pushing off to the east here is eventually going to start to upwell along the coast of South America. American replace this warmer water that we have right now that reflects El Nino. And that's going to bring some neutral and then La Nina status here as we go on in towards the summer and the fall months upcoming here. If we take a look at the current conditions, obviously we're 100% in El Nino. That's where we are right now. But look at the La Nina odds start to go up as we reach July, August, September, and October. We're already there about 76% chance of being in La Nina conditions by the time we get towards October. So interesting stuff here. That usually means much more exciting weather here across much of the Pacific Northwest. Taking a look at where we are now, here's Nino 3.4 or 1.8. That's still a strong El Nino. And this is where we measure those conditions across the equatorial Pacific between 170 West and 120 West. There's the Hawaiian Islands, there's Australia, South America, and there is Mexico. And you can see our long climb out of last year's La Nina. And now we've been all the way climbing just on the borderline of a strong slash super El Nino. But we are now on the downward trend and we're talking about neutral and La Nina conditions coming up here pretty quick in the next few months. This is looking all the way back December 24th, 2020, when we were in La Nina conditions. And you can see the upwelling here off the coast of South America, that cold tongue extending out across the equatorial Pacific, marking those La Nina conditions. Look at that warm water just bunching up in the Western Pacific, Siberia, Russia up there, Asia, pretty cold place in the wintertime. You can imagine the temperature gradient that forms here and this jet stream remains retracted here off uh, over the Western Pacific Ocean. Downstream from that, you get ridging and then you bring a more variable jet stream into the Pacific Northwest, better for cold air intrusions. I'm not showing you the sea surface temperature anomalies just yet. And this is looking at where we are now. And you can see that warmer water is more uniformly spread across the equatorial Pacific. And that allows for some jet extensions to come across the Pacific Ocean here, bringing some warmer weather generally for the Pacific Northwest and usually some stronger storms at times during these El Ninos into California. Now we're looking at sea surface temperature anomaly. And this is where we are now. You can see the El Nino still in charge here across the equatorial Pacific. And this is looking back at La Nina all the way back in December 2020 here as well. So you can kind of see the difference there across the equatorial Pacific in the uh, sea surface temperature anomalies. If we take a look here, this is the last four weeks, and you can see some of that cooler water is trying to make its way to the surface here. So we're going through that downgrade right now, and the eventual demise of El Nino is no doubt within a few months of where we are now. That doesn't mean we're still not going to feel some impacts here across some of North America over the next couple months, though. And this is looking at the evolution of that cold pool there underneath the surface. Again, the surface would be up here, and you can see the warmer water in the top 100, 150 meters. But you see as we're going through that warmer water, water is getting shallower and some of that cooler water is pushing off to the east and eventually that is going to push into South America and up well and it will replace this above average water here across the equatorial Pacific and mark the end of our El Nino and the beginning into our next La Nina phase. Taking a look here something interesting so this is when the cold air outbreak happened across some of the northwest Pacific Northwest and you can see the jet was retracted for a time here so that probably helped we had the ridging out here and we allowed for that Northwest flow getting some of that cooler air back down to the Pacific Northwest however you can see the bottom one here that jet ripping across the Pacific Ocean that jet extension that brought the very powerful round of storms into the state of California more recently or so kind of interesting look at things there and you can see during that time frame of course Northwest Canada was much below normal temperature wise and that did include the Pacific Northwest now, looking at the CFS, so you can clearly see the demise of El Nino is definitely incoming here as we go through the spring and the summer months. And take a look here. This would be for March. There's April. You can see some of that cold water emerging. Then we go on into May, June, July, August, September. And you can't miss the signal there with the very cold tongue extending across the equatorial Pacific. This is looking at the European seasonal. So here we go. Look at that. Clearly uh, La Nina right, or El Nino right now. And then as we go to March, April, May, June, July, August, pretty good model agreement there. And it's been like that for a couple months now. And you can see the Canadian model also is going to go through the same phases here as we go through the summertime coming into fall. Clearly La Nina is favored in the models upcoming here. This is the CFS 
and it, I'm gonna put this into motion as well. And there's nothing new here. I mean, it's been showing this for months now. So we have pretty good confidence that we are gonna be headed back to this La Nina phase as we go on in towards next fall. So neutral conditions, this is what we call the Pacific Walker circulation. We try to locate where this deeper convection is going to take place. And El Nino and La Nina can tell us a lot about that. This is the typical setup here. Water is still generally warmer as a whole here, just general currents across the Western Pacific. And if we go to La Nina, that gets enhanced. The trade winds kick up a bit here and we get a lot of warm water there. And we get that powerful jet coming into the Western Pacific. Like I mentioned, then we get ridging downstream and we get some of that more variable jet stream into the Pacific Northwest for a potentially cooler conditions. El Nino is different. That deep convection starts to set up towards the date line and maybe even a little further east here because of that warmer water. And a lot of that has to do with the Southern Oscillation Index. It's one way we can measure the atmospheric response to El Nino conditions. So Tahiti's right about there. There's Darwin and El Nino. Like I mentioned, that deeper convection starts to come out over the Pacific Ocean. And once we get that lower pressure in Tahiti, and the higher pressure in Darwin, we go into negative territory here. The air starts to flow from Darwin, as a general rule anyway, towards Tahiti. During La Nina, that's reversed. Higher pressure would be over Tahiti, and Darwin would be getting the lower pressure. So here is that Southern Oscillation Index since 2000. And there's the super El Nino there, the negative territory. And the current El Nino, as you can see, the atmospheric response, not quite as strong. But you can also see the triple dip La Nina that we went through here also, and definitely positive. And this is looking at that again. So something interesting happened in January, it went positive for a time. And that's probably one thing that helped with the cold air intrusion into the Pacific Northwest. And a lot of this time we've been slightly in negative territory, but over the last bit of time here, the daily contribution, as you can see in these uh, aqua uh, bars on this chart here. I've definitely been going negative as we go through February. That's probably what's going to help out with some future storm formation as we go through the next week or two into Southern California. It's still kind of the El Nino flavor going on here. It might be the last gasp of El Nino, in fact. Now, I talked about this like way back last fall about how El Nino a lot of times doesn't really show its face until you get to February, March, and April. And that seems to be the case of what's going on here so far this month as California has been going through some pretty extensive flooding here, a nice jet extension all the way across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, I was starting to get those questions as we're going through January. Hey, where's El Nino? Why hasn't it showed its face yet? And you can kind of tell people didn't watch some of those people weren't watching my video way back in October here because you can see the the signature for El Nino is weaker during November, December, and January, and it starts to really ramp up, especially for places like California in February, March, and April. It's strong Gulf of Alaska low, and you get the big temperature contrast, and you can really get that jet stream ripping across the Pacific. Now, taking a look here for SeaTac, this goes from 1981 all the way to 2023, and I uh, probably don't have to remind many people, but we have zero snowfall this year. And that is kind of a classic signature of some of these strong El Ninos. Look at it back in 82, 83, zero. 91, 92, zero. There's another zero. There's another zero. There's another zero. This would be the sixth El Nino that we would have a zero snowfall since 1981. And most of these are strong El Nino. So this is not too much of a surprise. Some of the weaker El Ninos, you can get some snowfalls. You remember back in February, 2019 was actually a weak El Nino. Also, the only time during a strong El Nino that we've recorded snow in the last 40 plus years was January, 1998, when we got three inches and it all happened in one single day. So not kind of snow here in the snow lovers in the lower elevations of the Pacific Northwest. Taking a look at SeaTac, Washington from 79 to 2023. The rainfall is not that much of a signal. Actually, El Nino Januarys are slightly wetter than La Nina. And there's not much of a signal February, March, or April as well. I mean, April's are even a little bit wetter also, according to El Nino. However, the big difference is coming to go to temperature. And this jet last January was actually below average. We did make a run trying to get back towards normal at the end of the month. But you can see the signal is not that big between La Nina and El Nino in January. However, you get to February and now you're over three degrees difference. Look at how much warmer these El Nino years are. And same thing with March, pretty notable. And also the April signal is quite notable as well, over two point, about 2.3 degrees different. And that's a mean difference. So that's pretty intense, pretty noticeable. Now, if we look at Hayak, Central Cascades, Washington State, snowfall per season, the blue is in the La Nina here, and you can clearly see the signal. The really big years are generally La Nina, and sometimes El Nino years don't do too bad, but for the most part, the La Ninas do overperform versus the El Nino years. 
And you can check out Whistler and Stevens Pass, Snoqualmie, Stampede, and you've got all this information here. I mean, Snoqualmie Pass, the difference between strong El Ninos and strong La Ninos is pretty darn right stark. And that goes for a lot of areas. You can see Stevens Pass, you know, 232 inches more on average, <laughs> the pretty big difference. Yeah. And that kind of goes up and down the coastline here across the Cascades for the Pacific Northwest and Whistler gets a bit more also. Now, this is something that I've been tracking along here over the last year and a half or so. And this is September, 2020. The blue line here is actually what happened. And you can see the forecast for the European model. So pretty darn right good at times with some of these plumes trying to predict the ENSO temperatures there. You can see we were in La Nina at the time and it started predicting this climb out all the way back in September of 2022. Now we go to November and you can kind of see December, pretty good forecast here. Again, verifying quite nicely, January, February, clearly predicting the climb to, towards a moderate to strong El Nino at this point. And then they kept ramping up as we went through the spring. And then something happened at summertime here. It kept predicting some very strong El Nino signal here, but the actual forecast came a little bit low, but still the El Nino was pretty strong. Uh, again, kind of September and October on the lower side of the ensemble envelope there. And you can see December didn't do that well, but it wasn't that far off from what actually happened. But still uh, kind of under kind of cutting it a little bit short there uh, versus what we actually got. It kept predicting a little bit higher of El Nino conditions, even though we did get right up, maybe kind of brushing the super El Nino territory. Take a look at January here. You can now see the, uh, the, the forecast here in the European ensemble members there as it's predicted to start getting down towards neutral by the time we get towards summer. And then you can see the February one kind of even a little bit lower here as well. So we'll see how those do, but you know, pretty good bet we're headed towards neutral and then La Nina conditions in the upcoming year. So anyway, hopefully this helps you understand La Nina and El Nino a little bit better. I'll do my normal briefings for tomorrow. Leave some comments and questions below. Let me know what you think, what else you'd like to hear about. And I will talk to you guys tomorrow.